Thank you very much for a great lecture. My name is Danielle Doan, and I'm the editor-in-chief of SFC Today, our campus newspaper, and I'm joined by my co-editors, Anthony Ruggiero and Justin Worsley. Hi. Um, Hi. We've prepared a few questions that we would love to hear your thoughts on. Um, how did being on the staff of the Daily Tar Heel at UNC help you prepare for your career as a journalist for the New York Times? I think if you want to be a journalist, if you want to write, you have to begin, you have to begin writing and practice writing and do a lot of it, or you have to begin interviewing and do a lot of it. I think, um, like anything else in life, um, practice makes better. Um, so the fact that I, I did a lot of this in college, um, I think it simply made me more fluent in it. Um, and and that's and that's really the main value it has. Um, you know, no one no one can just jump right into anything. They have to kind of build up to it. And if anyone in here is interested in a career writing or in journalism, I think the 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 one thing that holds true even in the changing marketplace is you know you begin small and you keep getting larger and larger, um, and you keep on striding out onto onto larger and larger stages with the preparation and the seasoning you've gotten from the stages you're coming from. And so I think it's very important to. To, to start as early as you know you have an interest and to really kind of train yourself. Thank you. Um, reading your book made me think about all the times I had growing up in an Italian-American household, especially Sunday dinners with grandma and the entire family. Do you think that your love for food would be different if you were brought up in a different house? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I, I think um, I'm, I'm half Italian on my dad's side. Um, that's the Bruni side. Um, and, uh, and my mother, who was an Irish, Welsh, English mix, just basically kind of gave up and became Italian because it's just... <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 anyway, um, you know, nobody loves food like Italians do. The stereotype, and it's a nice stereotype, is true. And I mean, I grew up with um, a grandmother who, uh, whose main gesture of love was to cook enormous amount, amounts of food. I grew up with a mother who decided that was kind of, sort of neat and adopted that. Um, and I can't think of a, of a family moment that wasn't suffused in food. Um, so it had everything to do with my love of food and, if you've read my book, with my overlove of food, you know, because there there's a flip side to loving food, which is being a little bit too uh, tyrannically governed by it, which was the case for me for a long time. I'm uh, Anthony Ruggiero, an assistant editor of the paper. Um, as the man who has committed... Uh, completely determined the fate of restaurants throughout the world. You are either the most liked well person in the industry or the most hated, depending on your review. Can you give us a few examples of the best and worst food experiences you had as a critic? Um, well, let me tell you about, like, let me tell you about the, the loved and hated. Um, uh, I, one of the many, many terrible experiences that I had was at a restaurant called, um, uh, and my memory's going to fail me now because it seems like years ago, the Kobe, Kobe Club which has since closed. Um, and it was a Japanese steakhouse that was opened by a restaurateur named Jeffrey Chotaro. I thought I was, sorry. Um, it was a Japanese restaurant that was opened by a restaurateur called Jeffrey Chotaro. Um, and it was a very kind of weird place in which there were a thousand samurai swords dangling upside down from the ceiling. And it was very kitschy and very gimmicky. Um, and I gave it, I think, a zero-star review, and I think that was not the first or even the second time I'd given one of his restaurants a terrible review. Um, and so he actually took out a, a full-page ad in the New York Times that he paid a premium to make sure the ad would be placed opposite the restaurant column um, that basically said I was a horrible human being, which is sometimes true, and um, that said I just had knew, knew nothing about what I was doing. Uh, a couple months later, um, he opened another restaurant, and he publicly said uh, that uh, he would give a trip to the Car Caribbean to any employee who spotted me on my way in the door and made sure I got thrown out, because he didn't want this restaurant reviewed. It was the only time during my years as a restaurant critic that I really did serious disguises. I went to, I, I, I had wigs made for my head. I went to a, I went to a hairdresser to have the wigs styled. Um, I did get into this restaurant three times. It was called Wild Salmon. And I gave it a one-star review, which is OK, because it was pretty good. And he took out another smaller ad, saying that he was glad I liked his salmon and that you know, it was a peace offering. So there's, so there's, there's a love turn to, there's a hate turn to love story. With uh, childhood obesity in the United States a growing problem, what do you think of Michelle Obama's points for a healthier America? I think Michelle Obama's um, uh, attempt to do a lot of this through public education is great because I think that's the way it has to be. Um, but I don't think she goes far enough. She doesn't go nearly far enough. I mean, 
being a first lady, she's not going to advocate for divisive or polarizing legislation. I mean, that's not what first ladies or hopefully someday first laddies will do, you know. Um, so so I, don't, I don't think she's going to get as far as she'd like to because there's not a lot of teeth to it. Um, you know, for instance, one of the big debates among uh, public health professionals is whether uh, the food stamp program should permit people to use food stamps for sugar sodas and for junk food. Currently, there are no restrictions. So you could take your food stamps and you could just buy a whole bunch of, you know, multi-liter Cokes with it. Um, I, I personally think it's not an insult to people or unkind to put some restrictions on the food stamp program. She hasn't weighed, and, and this is a big debate among the people who follow this issue on Capitol Hill and throughout the country. New York, for instance, wanted to do this, um, both at the state and city level. Bloomberg was very interested in it. Um, the federal government shut them down. Um, I think that, so she hasn't weighed in on stuff like that, so I think she is bringing up the right concerns. Um, she's recognizing that one of the ways you get people to change is to, is to plant the seed and just to keep hammering at them that this is the way you should be. But I don't think she's going to get all that far because she, by dint of her position, can't wade into some of the substantive stuff that needs to go along with the public education. Hi, I'm Justin Worsley, one of the other editors. Um, you may not know this, but St. Francis College uh, is home to a nationally ranked water polo team. I, I heard that uh, um, when I came in. Yeah, you guys. We I made, played water uh, polo. We made the final four last year, I believe, correct? Um, twice in the last several years, actually. I'm sorry. Congrats. Um, an accomplishment that we are very proud of. Uh, based on your book, I know that you had an, an illustrious career as a swimmer. And I was wondering, do you still swim today for health or recreational purposes? And uh, if not, do you, what are the best practices you think you do to stay fit? Um, I don't swim anymore for, rec for recreational or fitness purposes because I swam so much as a kid, um, you know, getting up at like 4.45 to go swim for like 90 minutes before school. I spent so much time doing laps, staring at that black line at the bottom of the pool that when I stopped swimming when I went to college, um, I really, it was as if every lap I could ever swim had been swum out of me. You know, I mean, I just, I just, it, I find it so when I try, I've tried upon occasion because it is such a great way to stay fit. It's like not something that strains your knees. You know, it's, it's gentle on the body. Um, I can't swim more than 20, 20 laps without losing my mind. So for me, I, I run a little bit. That's getting harder as you get older. It's like you come in from a run and your hip hurts and the next day it's your ankle and the next day it's your toe and you know. Let me just tell you, aging is something you should not look forward to. Um, <laughs> but I, I do a, uh, I, I'm one of those people who was, you know, designed by God or whomever to be 300 pounds. So um, I do a lot of different things to try to keep it, you know, like 100 or so below that. I, I lift weights a lot these days just because for some reason I find that works better as you age than, than, than running because running is so... Um, it's so tough on the joints. I do the elliptical. I mean, I do the stuff everybody does. I just try to make sure never to let more than two days go by without doing it. Also, uh, what specific advice would you give to college students hoping to pursue a career in uh, writing, journalism, or culinary arts in the future? Um, culinary arts I can't really answer because I never really had a career in culinary arts. Um, but writing and journalism I can answer. And I mean, it's sort of, it's sort of an expanded answer from what I said before, which is um, I think for starters you need to do it. You know, people always say, um, where, you know, where can I go do it? Well, one of the, one of the bad things about the internet and the fact that, uh, that, that there's not really a great economic model for people to make money on the internet, one of the bad things about that is, that is that it's harder than ever, I think, for someone to come out of college or graduate school and get a job that will truly pay them a living wage from the get-go um, as a journalist or as a writer. But one of the good things is there's a sort of democracy to the internet. So if you are writing and you are writing well, um, there's really no limit to who may end up reading you and seeing you. Um, because there's, a, there's an ability for word of mouth to build. And if you were, let's say 20 years ago, you'd come out of college and you'd gone to work for the, um, the Long Beach, California paper. You could be doing great stuff, um, but your audience was only going to be so big. If you're doing great stuff on a blog that you started, yeah, the odds are really small your blog is going to take off, but the sky is the limit in terms of what could happen um, because nobody has to get a physical copy of that thing or pay anything to see what you're doing. They just need to have one person link to it and tell them, hey, there's something over here. And so I think that um, if you are a sort of creative entrepreneur, for lack of a better phrase, I think you have 
um, some long shot possibilities, but some possibilities that never existed before. Um, and again, you just you need to do what you want to do on a small level and just keep trading it up for more visible opportunities as you get better. Just one last question in regards to your speech today. Um, do you think Mitt Romney has what it takes to defeat President Obama this November? Um, I don't. Uh, I think. I think anything could still happen. Absolutely. Um, I think that. Um, I think it's interesting. Interesting the way you asked your question. I'm not sure Mitt Romney has what it takes to defeat Barack Obama because I think, and this kind of goes back to what I was talking about. I think he is such a phenomenally flawed candidate. Um, that I don't know that he can overcome that. You know, and it's interesting, again, to ask ourselves, we ended up with him because what were the alternatives? Michelle Bachman, Herman Cain, Newt Gingrich, Rick Perry. I mean, this is the greatest nation on earth you know, to come full circle, and that's our field of Republican primary candidates. I mean, that's something really, really to be concerned about. I don't know that Mitt Romney has what it takes, but I will say that um, with unemployment over 8%, um, with a lot of... Um, valid and less valid disappointment with the president, um, it is going to be within the realm of possibility, you know, for a few weeks longer um, that he could turn it around because I think there are people who, well, right now they cannot see themselves voting for Mitt Romney. Um, they're not excited at the, at, the, at the opportunity to vote for Barack Obama. And in that, you know, in that emotional reality is an opportunity for Mitt Romney if he can somehow right his ship. Thank you. Uh, one quick question. I teach, my name is Mark McSherry, I teach the journalism classes and uh, I'm rushing off to teach a media literacy class and it's the week where I'm talking about spin doctors and the influence they have on the political news that we all consume. Can you talk to, in your experience, uh, what it's like dealing with Axelrod and Stuart Stevens and Carville and Matlin and those types? Do, how much influence do they have on what we read? The spin doctors. You know, I think I think they have less influence as spin doctors than they do for another reason. Um, but to to get to the spin doctor part of your question, I mean, yeah, you know, if if you saw my inbox, I've known Stuart Stevens. He was he worked on the Bush campaign in 2000. So I've known Stuart Stevens, who's now like the kind of head poobah of the Romney campaign, for for 12, 12 13 years now. You know, so I, I hear from him frequently. Um, I don't think the way they frame, the, I don't think what they tell us to observe or what they kind of try to tell us they, they see, which may not be what we see, I don't think it has an enormous influence because we all have our own eyes and we all have our own minds. What's, what's sometimes more influential and a little bit of a concern is that those are also the people who control access to the candidate. And one of the real tensions in journalism, um, whether it's whether you have a Sunday morning talk show that you're trying to book people for, or whether you are covering a national campaign for the New York Times, is how do you operate in an utterly candid um, and a truly unafraid way, you know, and write what needs to be written and say what needs to be said um, without completely having those people shut you down and shut you off? And does it matter whether you have access to the candidate or not? It's interesting, I mean, since Tim Russert died, I don't think there's a program on the air um, where candidates are put through interviews as challenging as he put them through. Or there's certainly very few of those. Most of the programs on the air tend to be partisan, you know, one direction MSNBC, another direction Fox. And most of the interviews are either inherently sympathetic ones or they're just kind of anodyne ones. Um, and one of the reasons I think you get that is because uh, news shows, newspapers, news magazines, they need candidates, they need these people to kind of participate, to sit down for photos, to sit down for TV interviews, in order to have the content to put out. And there's a, there's a question always about can you be as hard as you need to be when you need something from these people and from their operations. I think that's a bigger problem and question than, than hearing their spin, which is easy to just kind of like hear and disregard. That's David Brooks, right? Well, he was talking about um, two strains of conservatism, and yeah, I mean, he was making what I thought was a really excellent point, which is that the only strain of conservatism that exists anymore is the sort of Wall Street, low taxes, low regulations, completely money-focused conservatism, and not, not the moral dimension stuff that you're talking about. Um, I think he's right. I think if you, if you think about what we have heard during this campaign, I've never been through a campaign where I've heard the word taxes more often. And it's sort of mind-boggling to me because right now we have very low taxation in this country. 
and we have a really, really high debt, and yet we have, um, not just on the Republican side, we have two candidates essentially promising that they won't raise taxes. Now, Obama says he'll raise them, but on people making a million dollars or more. Well, that's a pretty easy electoral arithmetic to do. That's not gonna lose you that many votes, you know? What about everyone else? I mean, it's, it's, been, it's been amply proven by economists that the only way to raise enough revenue through, the ta through, through, tax, you know, through taxes and through the tax code to really, really make a dent in the, uh, in the debt is to raise taxes across the board. Yes, progressively much more on higher income owners, but they're not a big enough pool of people to really solve your problem. And neither of the candidates in this election are talking about raising taxes an iota on you know, the vast majority of American people. Um, I don't know how we got to that point. I don't know. This is something I'm thinking about writing about for Sunday. I don't know what happened to our, our ability to make sacrifices or our interest in talking about making sacrifices. Um, but anyway, back to David Brooks. I think he's right about the Republican Party having kind of abandoned the community-minded mention and just become very, very kind of dollars and cents and taxes. And in their case, like no one's supposed to pay to higher taxes, not, you know, not a single person, um, which I think is not not right or sustainable. Uh, yes, uh, I'd like to thank you for everything that you said. And I hope the young people in the room appreciate your wisdom. I'd like to ask you, as the grandmother of a 20-year-old and somebody who has been teaching for 40 years, I am very concerned about the issues of privacy mm -hmm. and the Twitter and the Facebook. I went to elementary school with a lot of people whose parents were blacklisted during the McCarthy era. So I was wondering if you could speak to the issue of privacy and what it means to this next generation. Well, um, I don't think we have any privacy anymore. Um, I, and I don't know how we, I don't know how we, you know, shut the lid on that Pandora's box. Um, uh, you know, whether it's, whether it's internet bullying, you know, which is a big problem, or whether it's the sort of stuff I was talking about in terms of, of the way we uh, are willing to and do eavesdrop on candidates as if they're becoming candidates means everything is fair game. Um, I think privacy has gone away in this country almost entirely. Um, and I just, I don't know how to answer your question because I don't know what we do to get it back. We can't, we can't technologically regress, which is, a, and, and, and it's the technological advances and it's the internet and, you know, uh, iPhone video and iPhone, all of those are the things that have destroyed our privacy. Um, I think the only way we get any of it back is for people, individuals, to make the decision, each of us, ourselves, that we're going to observe some civilized lines, you know, that we're not going to put any video we happen to, well, first of all, we're not going to take video of anything and everything, and we're not going to put anything we capture on video that might interest somebody on the, um, on the internet if it's going to hurt somebody. Um, you know, I don't know that they can. I don't know that they can protect themselves from the people around them. But I think if, if I think if enough young people make the decision, you know, the way norms get established is that a majority of people decide something is the right way to behave, and then that has the power of peer pressure, of peer influence. So I would say, you know, it's the golden rule all over again. If you decide certain things are not right, and enough people, enough individuals, to decide that that is not something that's right and that's not something that should be allowed. I think that example will end up influencing others. Will you always have um, people who will kind of break the norm and do uh, destructive things? Yeah, I don't think you can protect yourself from that. Um, you know, I, maybe there are some answers that have to do with the settings you put on your Facebook account and all that, but I think the stuff that, that, that really becomes disturbing is stuff that you, you ultimately can't just with switching your Facebook settings uh, protect yourself from. Thank you. Let's give Mr. Bruni another round of applause. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. You are a very much a role model for our students and our faculty. The college community has gained much from listening to you today about your own career and experiences. Our students have gotten a sense of what it takes to achieve their dreams and have a passion for what they do. Passion has always been a word that many of the previous lecturers from the series have also impressed. You have to have a passion for whatever you undertake. There is going to be a book signing outside in the lobby. 
I hope you will buy the book to learn more about Frank's uh, background and his career and his experiences. Thank you again, and we look forward to our next session. <laughs>